Good evening. I'd like to thank you all for braving the weather. My name is Mark Lysett. I'm the director of the Center for International Studies and the Program on the Global Environment. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to the inaugural event in our year-long speaker series, Global Inequalities, the Conditions and Consequences of Social and Natural Disparity. As many commentators have observed, we live in a moment of marked inequality. Whether measured in indices of income, livelihood, or even aspiration, transformations in global economies, in social and political welfare, and even in nature itself have contributed to a growing re-spatialization of wealth, of poverty, and of capacities both nationally and across the globe, adding new dimensions to both the conditions of and the fact of uneven and often inadequate access to resources. Through this year's speaker series, we hope to begin a discussion of the character and experience of these inequalities and their consequences in today's global setting. Toward this end, we are very pleased to welcome both Marina Citrin and the university's own W.T.J. Mitchell to discuss protesting inequality, Occupy and Beyond. Occupy Wall Street, with chants of we are the 99%, brought the issue of inequality directly into the public spotlight here in the United States. Elsewhere in the world, in Greece and Spain, in Egypt and Tunisia, in Brazil and Russia, ordinary people flooded into public spaces just preceding or just following Occupy to take a stand against economic disparity and unresponsive government. Our presenters today are leaders in the effort to understand this popular outpouring against inequality and its global dimensions. Marina Citrin is a writer, lawyer, teacher, and organizer, and was an active participant in and reporter on Occupy Wall Street. She is the author of Everyday Revolutions, Horizontalism and Autonomy in Argentina, as well as a broad range of scholarly and public articles. Recently, she has co-authored two important volumes on Occupy and related social protest movements, They Can't Represent Us, Reinventing Democracy from Greece to Occupy, and Occupying Language, The Secret Rendezvous with History and the Present. Dr. Citrin holds a JD in International Women's Human Rights from CUNY Law and a PhD in Global Sociology from Stony Brook University. Professor Mitchell, already familiar to so many of you, is professor of English and Art History at the University of Chicago and also editor of the interdisciplinary journal, Critical Inquiry. He is an acclaimed scholar and theorist of media, visual culture more broadly, and iconology, or the study of images across the media. He has been the recipient of numerous awards, including the Guggenheim Fellowship and the Maury Prize in Art History. His publications include What Do Pictures Want, Art in the Public Sphere, and The Politics of Interpretation. Most recently, he published Occupy, Three Essays in Disobedience with Michael Tossig and Bernard Harcourt. As we begin, just a word on the format of this evening's event. Each of our speakers will, in turn, offer us a brief presentation before engaging with each other in a discussion of social protest movements today. We will then open the floor to audience questions. A reception and book signing will follow just outside that door. So now, please join me in welcoming Maria Citrin and Tom Mitchell. Should I go to the podium here, or are we? The oh, podium's fine. Um, I might close the computer. Is that going to cause problems? If it does, we'll see what happens. OK. Um, so I'm going to briefly make a really huge argument, <laughs> which is, and my co-author and I both in, our, um, in this book, They Can't Represent Us, argue that we're living in a new historical epoch, like 
1968, like 1848. Um, and the main reasons for that are both the numbers of people who have been organizing around the world, and we're talking many tens of millions of people, um, and then the consistent forms of organization. And dating this kind of new, um, both from 2010, when we're talking about Egypt and Tunisia and then the Occupy movements, but also, and it's a chapter in our book, in Latin America in 1989, not coincidentally also the time of the fall of the Berlin Wall. Um, and we can get into some of the reasons for this in the discussion, um, if people want to go there, perhaps. Uh, but the consistent forms that um, are most significant, and most people will know this, are the use of space in these new movements, kind of the construction of territory and space, um, horizontal social relationships that are constructed, so creating new ways of relating to one another that are ever-changing, um, rethinking democracy as something that's direct and participatory and rejecting representation, um, and rethinking power in relationships to institutions of power. And while we make a distinction with um, the claims being made in, say, Egypt and Tunisia versus, say, Spain, Occupy, Portugal, Brazil, Turkey, um, Occupy the US, I said, Canada, um, there are certain similarities. And one of the similarities is um, the beginning point, and this beginning point of just a no and then we saw this with the slogans around the world. Um, you can even just kind of hear it with the Egyptian kifaya, which means enough. Um, actually going even back to then the Zapatistas in 1994 in Mexico with the yabasta, meaning enough. Um, in Sindagma Square in Athens, they had banners also saying yabasta, so hearkening the Zapatistas. Um, that no nos representan in Spain and Portugal and Brazil, in Portuguese and in Spanish, but that they don't represent us, um, and on and on. These kinds of exclamations, not just of a no, but of a refusal. Not just, no, we're against this and then we demand this, but we refuse. And talking to people around the world and reading what people have been saying, it's a refusal of crisis that's not just, it is inequality, it is economic crisis, but people are refusing a lack of a future. People are refusing a moral crisis, a cultural crisis, an ethical crisis, an environmental crisis. I mean, people refer to just an overall sense of crisis um, and, and then saying no. And it's in that moment of no and in refusal that people don't go and make claims on institutions of power. So I'm going to continue to refer to these as movements, but not as social movements, because um, what we have in the social sciences as far as how we understand social movements isn't adequate actually to understand, I believe, um, what has been taking place in these movements. And it is in particular because of this lack of a claim on institutions of power most of the time. So there's a lack of a contentious relationship. Um, and the people turn to one another. And this is what we see and hopefully we'll see in some of the images, but an image after image in the plazas with the thousands and sometimes tens of thousands of people coming together to face one another. So really, literally turning their backs on these institutions of power to face one another and create new relationships in those spaces. And here, the turning the backs, it is important to note that it isn't um, necessarily ideological or it didn't start out as an ideological turning your back on an institution of power. In so many countries, people protested and protested and protested and did first make claims. There were five general strikes in Greece against austerity. And there was absolutely no answer from the state, and they continued with austerity. And this is seen in place after place. So people's sensation is the government is ignoring us, so we are looking to one another. So and then in that space, and so not feeling represented, that they don't represent us in that space, creating new relationships. And then again, you see some of these affirmative slogans that we're all familiar with of the 99%, or in Spain, it was democracia real ya, as an exclamation, an affirmation of real democracy. Um, the, uh, the people must rule is something they said in Portugal. And one of my favorites in Moscow is they did say they can't represent us. So then they also said they can't even imagine us, which I think is this really beautiful conjuring. Um, and then the massive assemblies that were formed. And I don't know if people participated or saw some of these often really long and unwieldy assemblies that would go on for hours and hours and hours. But some of what that was about was really people having their voice heard for the first time and being acknowledged, and that is central to all of these movements, is the listening and being heard. And so the use of the people's mic in New York spreading to so many cities that didn't actually have laws around needing permits for sound. Um, and all over the world, people were using people's mic. I was in London, and they used people's mic, and it was a group of maybe 50 people. So it wasn't actually necessary. It was more that sense of repeating one another's voice to, to really 
get that active listening and hearing one another. Um, and then again, in all of the plazas um, around the world, creating prefigurative relationships. So relationships that try as much as possible to create mini societies, mini alternative societies of what people desire. So just meeting basic needs, the food, the libraries, the mediation, yoga, childcare, all kinds of things, conflict resolution, haircutting. I love that in Hong Kong right now in the plazas, they also have free haircuts, which they had in Tahrir Square um, in Egypt. So kind of borrowing from each other as well and thinking about the tools of, of how we prefigure. And then to kind of go quickly from the large plazas to then the places where they were larger. In some places, you know, in the United States, there were more than 1,000 50, give or take, um, occupies. So in villages, I was in Point Reyes in Northern California, which has a few hundred people, and they had an occupy in the town square, so they're the village square. So all over, they're kind of occupies. But when they were in the larger places um, all over the world, um, there was the decision, well, it was mixed. There's either a decision um, or repression, but people were forced out of the large plazas. In the United States, it was mainly repression. In Getsi Park, in Istanbul, it was repression. But in other parts of Turkey, it wasn't, it was choice. Throughout Spain, it was choice. In Plaza del Sol, they actually had a 24-hour consensus-based assembly with thousands of people, which sounds really overwhelming to me. Um, but at the end of it, they decided to no longer stay in the plaza, and it was mainly because they couldn't construct the type of democracy they were talking about with so many people from such different backgrounds in these spaces. So people went back to the neighborhoods or went back to schools or workplaces or other sites to construct the alternative. I mean, what the alternative is, is a multiple, multiple alternatives. Um, but in common with them, and this is now where we're going to kind of break from Egypt and Tunisia and probably Hong Kong um, and talk more about whether it's Occupy or Brazil or, or Bosnia, um, is the, the lack of looking to institutions of power or making claims on the state um, and people looking to one another. And so some of the projects that people came up with to work on through the assemblies in the neighborhoods where people are talking about what they have more in common um, is, well, what do we need? What do we need to do to either help survive the crisis or what's most important to us? Um, and many of the things that came out of that are ways of surviving. So the housing movement here in Chicago, people are probably familiar with the defense of housing. Um, that's something that actually t was taking place in Spain before the 15M movement. And now it started as a few groups called the Plataforma de los Afectados por los Desahucios, the people affected by the mortgage crisis. And now there are 260 groups. And they're people who are most affected by, meaning you're going to lose your home. You know, part of the spark of the, of the crisis in 2008 was a housing crisis and how that's affected so many millions of people around the world. And so in Spain, it was first neighbors coming together saying, you know, the banks aren't responding, the government's not responding, we need to keep people housed, so how are we going to do that? Well, we're going to physically prevent evictions. And so that's one of the main things that the plataformas have been doing, is physically preventing people from being evicted, doing that together with neighbors using the assembly form. Um, and then that has now spread to more recently um, in Spain and throughout Europe. Now this form of organizing has been taking place throughout Europe, um, where I'm living in Berlin, there are a number of groups in our neighborhood um, that both prevent people from being evicted, but are now taking over housing for people who need housing, sometimes entire buildings. In Italy, there was a coordinated day where in many cities throughout Italy, entire abandoned schools, abandoned apartment buildings were taken over to move, to move families in. Um, and then in Chicago, that's been taking place. Not just the defending people from being evicted, but actually moving homeless families into abandoned houses together with people in the neighborhood um, who realized it would be better to have a family living in an empty house rather than you know what empty homes sometimes can invite in a neighborhood. But the, the question of power in this and democracy in this is the coming together in this horizontal form in neighborhoods and then rather than petitioning the banks just doing it together. Later there's often a relationship to institutions of power but it's not the point of reference, it's not the beginning point. Um, and in many places there have been incredible successes as far as in Spain, entire municipalities saying now that you can no longer um, evict people for sometimes it's one year, sometimes it's two years. So there is, that, there is an answer from power, but it's not that that's the beginning point. Um, there are quite a few other examples around the world and people organizing in this way. In Greece, it's been predominantly around health care and then a tax that's been placed on people's electricity. So one of the many things the Greeks have been forced to do is pay 
money now when they get health care, which considering um, the depth of the economic crisis, it's really quite substantial if you have to pay five euros just to see a doctor and then after that for further treatment. So in the assemblies, what people decided to do was to make it so that there were days when health care is free. So they organized as an assembly and they talk to the doctors and nurses who are in agreement that healthcare should be free. Um, and they go and they block the cashiers. So just as when we have to go and pay, go and get whatever healthcare, we first go and show the insurance card or pay money or whatever, there's also now the cashier in Greece. And they block the cashier and they have little notes that they send and they say, okay, you know, the assembly of Peristeri or the assembly of Zografo is giving you, you know, the stamp to go take to the doctor to get healthcare. And that's spread now even to small islands in Greece where there aren't even neighborhood assemblies, but it's just neighbors coming together saying we have to make healthcare free one day because nobody has healthcare. Um, the government still hasn't responded. But interestingly, they haven't repressed in the same way that they have in other large places. And this is fairly consistent and perhaps another area of conversation. I'm throwing a lot out here, but another area of conversation that I think is really interesting is in these spaces of, say, the housing or around healthcare in Greece, or in Greece they're also doing it around um, electricity, um, where there's a tax that was imposed on people's electric bill, even though it has to do with the square meters of your home. And if you don't pay it, your electricity gets cut off, which also means hot water, heat. And so again, this is a pressing issue for people, and they found different creative ways of either not paying or destroying records that weren't digitalized, um, or um, one tactic is chasing the trucks when they come into the neighborhood to shut off the electricity, that elderly people who are on balconies and things kind of alert people in the neighborhood and they shut off the electricity. When they, when, sorry, they chase the trucks, they, they can't shut off the electricity. Um, but there's not been the kind of repression to this form of organizing as we've seen all over in the large plazas, which is something interesting because it's challenging private property and questions that you would think would be more essential to the state or as a threat. Um, a number of other, wow, my time is almost up. So another, uh, just a few little kind of examples, both of this question of organizing together, not having the point of reference of the state. Um, a phrase that's actually really handy for that is something that someone named Gopal came up with in Albany, California, um, which is outside Berkeley, and he's part of Occupy Farms. And what they did, and this was after Occupy in San Francisco and Oakland, there's a plot of land that um, the University of California was gonna turn into a whole food shopping complex. And it had been farmland, and they decided no, that farmland should actually be farmland. So they took it over and kind of Occupy Farms. And there were a whole number of things that they learned from the Occupy movements as far as how to preempt some of the challenges around democratic process. Um, but just the, the claim that they were making that I think is really handy in thinking about this is the idea of goals without demands. So it's not that there aren't goals, it's just that we're looking to one another to meet those. Um, and then another area that I think would be an interesting conversation is, well, doesn't this then do the work of the state? I mean, maybe that's why they're not repressing. Like, great, you know, if we're creating health care and, you know, or, you know, because there are all of these alternative clinics that have been set up throughout Greece and then also even in Portland, Oregon and some other places in the United States, people have started to, to create alternative free health clinics. Um, isn't that an answer, and I think that's a really important question to get into because I don't think that's what's going on. And kind of pointing to that is some of these then efforts at finding ways of surviving together are starting to push beyond just the immediate and think about questions of longer term sustainability. So um, there have been recuperated workplaces in Latin America for the last 15 years. It's something I've worked on having lived in Argentina. Recuperated meaning workers actually use that language recuperar to take back workplaces that have been abandoned by the former owners um, generally have gone bankrupt. And then the workers through this assembly form, this horizontal form, take over the workplace and run it together without hierarchy, with equal pay distribution. Um, and this, there's 350 of them in Argentina. They're now spreading, they've spread in Uruguay and, and Brazil and parts of Mexico. And now most recently in Europe. And what's really interesting in this phenomenon in Europe in the last three years is they're directly related to these newer movements. Um, and I think that explains perhaps this question of sustainability. So they're not just workplaces recuperated and then running as they were, which is often what it is in Argentina, but they're recuperated and then through conversations with people in the community um, and in the movements decide to produce something different. So every one of them in Europe is now producing um, ecological products. So Viomed in Thessaloniki in Greece was producing industrial glues, now they're producing olive oil-based cleaners. 
Um, there's a number of Fralib was producing a kind of Lipton tea in, in Marseille, and now they're producing herbal teas. And they're doing it together in assemblies often and in conversation with the community. So that's the part that's kind of sustainable and future looking is that in Thessaloniki, for example, Viomet, the workers make the decisions, but they have a consultative assembly of people in the community. So production is starting to be thought about in the longer term and in a different way, not just with workers in the workplace, but also in conjunction with people in the community. And then one last example in thinking about the sustainability question is because of crisis, um, there are more and more uh, pro direct producer-consumer networks. They also exist in the United States. They exist throughout the world. But you're literally farmers lugging potatoes into a city and selling them to people um, directly so you don't have to go through the intermediary. Um, that now is starting to be organized and planned a year in advance, sometimes longer. So how many potatoes might you use? And there are hundreds and hundreds of people involved in these assemblies talking about what they might or they plan to consume so that the producers can plant, thinking into the future and sometimes having some of the seed money, quite literally, um, into the future. So it is that kind of forward-looking thinking. Um, there's so many other points, and I think I'm going to stop. I don't know if we'll get into the question of the, we agree on the uh, Occupy and similar movements continuing around the world, but the spirit of them, I really like um, the way some of the movements themselves have referred to kind of what's been taking place. So in Spain, because they're no longer in the plazas, it's the 15M. What is that? Out of the 15M, they started to organize these mareas, which are tides, which is, you know, you kind of think of the imagery of the tides, and they're around certain questions like education and rethinking what education could look like in healthcare and rethinking what healthcare could look like as they're recreating it. Um, but using that idea of tides, and then from tides, they also talk about the clima of the movement, so like the climate. That's kind of infused ways of organizing in Turkey, out of Getsi, people talk about the soul of Getsi that's now in the neighborhoods. And I borrowed from the Spaniards and something I wrote recently about the DNA. And so I've talked about the DNA of Occupy kind of infusing ways that people have been organizing in the US. Okay. Is this working? Can you hear me in the back? Uh, I'd actually prefer to just go on listening to Marina because uh, her work uh, and her knowledge of the work that is being done in the name of Occupy globally is, uh, I think, unrivaled. She has been to many more sites uh, than I have. Most of my knowledge of this uh, comes in directly through the media. Uh, and. Uh, it was um, just a kind of um, uh, opportunity that led me into researching this topic. My main area of research for years has been uh, the global circulation of images. And uh, so uh, during the Egyptian revolution, during the Tahrir Square, I received an invitation from the University of Cairo uh, to come for the, the first anniversary of the January 25th celebration of Tahrir Square. And they said, we want you to reflect on the global circulation of images. What role did images play in uh, the Occupy movement in Cairo, in Egypt more generally, uh, across the Middle East? As we know, that was uh, the Arab Spring, with many different kinds of results, was also driven by uh, images in the mass media, uh, spectac spectacular images of crowds particularly, but also uh, specific icons that emerged uh, in these events. So I began to, uh, to survey these. This is armchair research. Uh, I'll admit it, I'm a Google image searcher. And uh, so much of, uh, of what I have to show you, uh, you could look it up. Uh, and my effort was uh, kind of two-pronged. One was to try to find out, okay, the, the images seem to circulate globally, but what is the difference of their meaning in local situations? How can we differentiate and at the same time see the links that produce what uh, is obviously a historical epoch? Uh, I totally agree with Marina that we are living in a time uh, which at least promises radical change. Whether it will deliver, we don't know, 
Uh, nobody's in a position to guarantee anything. Uh, but I think there are a lot of very energetic and imaginative people uh, who are, are mobilized. Uh, and uh, so uh, 1989 was supposed to be a great historical epoch, too. Remember the end of the Cold War. And I am a 1968er. I was uh, there uh, trying to levitate the Pentagon uh, in a strange coali coalition of uh, uh, leftists and hippies. Uh, so th th these epochs, they, they always promise a lot. Their, their delivery is uneven. Uh, 1789, uh, the, the jury for some people is still out on, on what that delivered. And for that matter, 1776. Uh, even Barack Obama has declared the American Revolution incomplete. Uh, and I think that's one of the, mo the wisest things he has ever said, uh, because it clearly is. Uh, in fact, uh, in many ways, that revolution of 1776 has been betrayed. Uh, and in many ways, it wasn't such a great revolution in the first place, because it depended on slavery, uh, dispossession of native populations, uh, so it, it had its uh, non-moments. Um, I, I have way too many slides in here to talk about, so I'm not going to... Uh, it seems to me, though, that the moment when Time delegated their person of the year as the protester and the mask protester, uh, a new notion of a kind of global citizenship emerged. And I say citizenship because uh, one of the things... The difference between, say, a people or a population and a citizenry is that citizens are supposed to be equal before the law. Uh, and that means a kind of anonymity. Uh, as we say, the law is no respecter of persons, of individuals, doesn't single out people by class. The law applies uh, evenly uh, across the board. One thing I think Occupy did in its emphasis on masking and anonymity uh, uh, and rather than designating a face of the movement and saying we are our great leader in Cairo is this person and this is our leader in Wall Street, uh, Occupy refused to do that. Uh, masking was an important part of it, uh, a kind of de deliberate erasure of individual faces like the charismatic leader, like say Mario Savio in the free speech movement in Berkeley in the 60s, became the face of free speech at Berkeley, uh, Tom Hayden. Uh, and, and other uh, figures emerged. That didn't happen with Occupy, and I think it was partly to affirm the right to anonymity. Uh, and as we know, the, the, the hacktivist group Anonymous uh, played an important role. Uh, so we saw images like this, which became a kind of logo for Occupy. Uh, the, the American Guy Fawkes. Uh, I, I myself found this, this particular mask uh, somewhat problematic. Uh, not that I have anything against um, Anonymous, uh, but I do have something against Guy Fawkes, uh, who was a, uh, a Catholic terrorist who tried to blow up the Houses of Parliament and was hanged. Um, it, it, and I know a lot of people say, oh, it wasn't really about that. It was about V for Vendetta, uh, the Wachowski brothers film. I think it's also a bad film. Uh, and and romanticize, it produced a cult of romanticization of violence, which seemed to me completely at variance with the point of Occupy, which was, by and large, a nonviolent movement, occasionally driven to violence uh, in self-defense. So uh, sometimes the masks, I felt, were maybe the wrong masks. Uh, you know, I, I don't think any movement is above criticism, and, uh, and certainly... Uh, when people gathered in Zuccotti Park and Grant Park in Chicago, they didn't just all sing Kumbaya. They, they debated. That's what made them uh, many democracies, uh, moments of face-to-face -face equality and, and democracy. Uh, very important. Uh, but the, Guy Fox has a nice way of kind of raising the emotional stakes of anonymity and saying, uh, you know, it, it, it's not about me. It's about us. It's about an idea that we are pushing forward. And the question is, what is that idea? Uh, I think Marina has made it clear there isn't any kind of single idea. It's very hard. For instance, what, are the pro what is Occupy Central in Hong Kong about? It's certainly not uh, about the same issue that Occupy Wall Street was. 
and immediately you see Occupy Wall Street was about economic inequality, uh, about the, the rapacious uh, regime of neoliberal capital. Uh, Hong Kong, the, the, some of the neoliberal capitalists are actually on the side of Occupy Central. Uh, it's about elections, free elections. So we have quite a different valence. Uh, nobody at Occupy Wall Street was saying we should overthrow the Obama administration. Everybody in Tahrir Square wanted to overthrow Mubarak. Uh, it was about tyranny uh, and actually about achieving representative democracy. So one place I think Marina and I might disagree a little bit is sometimes Occupy was gathered uh, around the idea of reasserting uh, the right to representative democracy. But in addition, I think it was also an attempt to manifest actually existing face-to-face -face democracy the good old-fashioned Rousseauian democracy of uh, unmediated by mass media, by social media, uh, but face-to-face -face relations. There were also a couple of uh, memorable icons. You remember this was Adbuster's proposal for as the logo of Occupy Wall Street. And I've always thought this told us something uh, important about the, the ideology uh, of this movement that it wasn't meant to kill the bull. It wasn't exactly anti-capitalist. It was about, I think, uh, turning Wall Street into a support for a new kind of dance, uh, a new kind of art. Uh, so it's not about violent revolution or overturning the government, but about transforming the nature of a econo global economic system, making it fairer, more equitable. In that sense, I thought of Occupy Wall Street as uh, in the main, a kind of reformist mo movement, much more than a revolutionary one. Uh, revolution and, uh, involves direct violence and suppression. Uh, the, the, the state feels itself threatened. And so this became one of the icons of, the, uh, of Tahrir Square and, uh, and the Arab Spring. Um, and one of the ways you can see that happening is not just because it was circulated in the mass media, but because of the miracle of digital imaging. Within two days, this same image became a banner held aloft by one of the largest women's demonstrations uh, ever in Egypt. Uh, it's as if uh, this old revolutionary uh, icon of the 19th century, Delacroix's liberty leading the people, had been, uh, in the age of digital media, somebody would have taken this picture and then the next day it would, would have become the banner of the revolution uh, almost uh, in, in real time. So also the, the presence of, of the figure of the female as a personification of, of revolution, uh, uh, of protest, violent or nonviolent. Uh, and of course, these pictures from the U.S. of, uh, of protesters, here a woman getting pepper sprayed directly in the face, uh, people getting beaten up, and logos like this saying it's important not only that we do this, but that we record it, that it be manifested. So uh, the American flag with the camera in place of the stars became a kind of logo of the importance of witnessing, uh, and particularly witnessing the violence of the state. Uh, so some people have said that Occupy Wall Street and the Occupy movement in the United States was a failure because it failed to do what the Tea Party revolution did. Remember, the Tea Party also dressed up as a revolutionary movement. The, the Boston Tea Party was, was the model. And you saw a lot of silly people running around uh, with tri uh, the, uh, what do they call them, the three-cornered hats with tea bags hanging on them. And the, uh, I know all my friends in the gay community said, teabaggers, eh? They really don't know what it is that they're doing. Uh, so it was, uh, it, it, it was a big laugh, but nobody's laughing at the Tea Party. They actually took power. They took power over the Congress of the United States, and in a, about three weeks they may uh, also be in control of the United States Senate, uh, making the last two years of Obama's administration uh, even less effectual than the first six years were. So uh, did that mean Occupy failed? Well, it certainly failed to do what the Tea Party did, that is, take political power. I, uh, I think, though, 
that the failure has to be put in a framework uh, that recognizes Occupy had to be violently suppressed. Uh, it, w it did not just wither away. It also, uh, not only did it not wither away, it metastasized. It w went all over the world. Uh, it, it went into communities. In Chicago, as Marina said, it went into the anti-eviction movement. Uh, it, it, it spread out in, and already in Zuccotti Park, it became a kind of NGO, uh, providing health services, clothing, food, and it, it, one of the problems that rapidly developed in Zuccotti Park was that the homeless descended uh, because they thought, this is a lot better place than the, uh, the bridge I'm sleeping under. Uh, these people will take me in, which they did. Um, there was also, with Occupy, I think a lot of it was sort of for the media. This was one of my favorite moments as I took this picture of this guy. Uh, that's a fake camera and a cardboard uh, microphone. Uh, he was circulating around, and it was like a magnet. Every media person wanted to interview him to find out, what is this? What are you? Uh, the idea that the mass media, uh, the whole world watching uh, idea, uh, was being activated by, by Occupy Wall Street, uh, far out of proportion to its size. When you think of the relation of Occupy to the media, everybody has you know, said this cliche, of course, this is the social, first social media revolution uh, or global movement based on things like Twitter and Facebook. I think that that's been pretty much exaggerated. It was very important that real bodies got together in real spaces in real time. Uh, but also that the mass media uh, were activated at the same time uh, so that despite its small size, Zuccotti Park became a global uh, phenomenon, just as Hong Kong right now. Is, uh, is achieving global recognition. So the media is, a, I think, a critical part of this. It's not the, the be-all and end-all, uh, but I think uh, it, it is to be taken seriously. Um, I could show you a lot more things, but the last thing I wanted to talk about is not uh, so much a visual image, but uh, a verbal image, a metaphor. And that's <clears throat> this word, occupy, itself. One of the questions that really puzzled me, and still puzzled me, maybe you can help think further about this, <clears throat> why Occupy? What, uh, if, I mean, it's, it's a name of a, uh, to occupy, to take up residence in, in a place, to, to seize a place. Uh, <clears throat> it is a tactic, uh, and it, it goes back, I think, to, um, to Gandhi and to Martin Luther King. Uh, the idea of the sit-in was a form of occupation. Uh, we talk about social movements, but it always struck me that one of the things that Occupy was echoing was this claim, we shall not be moved, the great civil rights era song. Say, we're not going away. We're here. You can drive us out. You can pepper gas us. You can tear gas us. You can make us run, uh, run for cover, but we're not going away. We are here to stay. And I think that <clears throat> that's the, that's the long-term test of Occupy. It didn't have the short-term results of seizing legislative power in representative democracy. It did have the effect in Egypt of overthrowing a tyrant, but we know that was the first stage and uh, the subsequent stages. Uh, my invitation to Cairo, by the way, they had to cancel. They said the revolution seems not to be going that well. Uh, so we're not going to have a celebration on the 25th. Uh, the, the, uh, the celebration will be postponed. So why, what is it about Occupy, though? It's a name, I think, of both a tactic and a strategy, if you want the, the kind of uh, theory jargon that goes with this. Um, it, it's a tactic insofar as it involves things like the sit-in, the camp, the encampment, not the march or parade, but the occupation of a space uh, and an attempt to dwell in that space. So one of the, the global icons that emerged was the tent city, the, the, the temporary village, uh, the, the place of living that suddenly springs up. Uh, and inside of it becomes not just a bunch of people, not just a crowd. Uh, if any of you were here yesterday for Jody Dean's wonderful lecture on the crowd, Occupy wasn't just about crowds. 
It was about crowds that self-organize. Most crowds are there because they're facing some spectacle. But these were crowds that were looking at themselves, uh, that were looking inward to say, who are we? Why are we here? To uh, engage in fundamental democracy. So it was a form of dwelling, uh, of being in a place and then self-organizing, uh, as Marina has mentioned, but very important that it was not just an undifferentiated crowd. There were cooks, uh, there were doctors, uh, there were librarians, there were media specialists, uh, there, there were uh, poets. Uh, I went to Zuccotti Park. I was invited by the education group uh, to uh, write a poem and to recite it. Uh, for, for mic check, uh, which I did. I wrote an extremely bad poem and uh, I recited it and had the pleasure of hearing my words repeated and ripple out into the, to the edge of uh, a pretty small crowd, I have to admit. Uh, so, so that's one thing. I think uh, Occupy meant uh, a notion of political action involving endurance, uh, durability, staying power, and not necessarily in one place, but uh, as, a, as a movement to not be moved, not to be pushed away. That's one important uh, aspect of it. I also think, since a lot of my research in the years leading up to this has been about uh, a very, very long occupation. As far as I know, maybe the longest military occupation of a people uh, on the planet, and that's uh, the state of Israel, Palestine, where People have lived under military occupation for a long time. The word occupation to me, when the Occupy movement first emerged, I said, wow, this is just, this is a situationist determinant on the word itself. As if suddenly Occupy, to Occupy became a kind of radically emancipatory and democratic gesture, a reassertion of the right to, of assembly. Uh, whereas for a very long time, the, the occupation uh, aside from meaning your job, uh, and one of my favorite posters, by the way, was a person who said, uh, I came to, uh, to, to this place and found an occupation, uh, as if Occupy had become a job itself. Uh, but it had been a very negative term, military occupations, and particularly the, uh, the condition of Palestine for the last half century. Uh, this is something I've had a lot of experience with and, and written about. And it struck me that somehow the, the word itself, the language of, of occupation, had been revolutionized. And that seemed to me, uh, it's not so easy to do that. Uh, to make a word suddenly mean something uh, the opposite of what it had meant. Uh, there was also one last thing I want to say about uh, Occupy and occupation. There, I'm a, an English professor, so I study rhetoric. Uh, and there is a trope. We, uh, my, uh, my late beloved colleague, Wayne Booth, always used to uh, uh, talk about this trope. It's called occupatio. Uh, it's the trope of saying without saying, of, or of deferring saying. Uh, saying, I'm not ready to say yet, or I don't have enough time to say yet, or it, it, it is not the moment to say uh, this. Uh, it also is, is often used uh, quite ironically. Uh, uh, somebody stands up and says, well, I have, I have no time to tell you, give you all my full arguments, and then they proceed to go ahead and do it. Uh, it, it so it's a trope of saying without saying. Uh, and. It, it connects also to speech act theory. In speech act theory, we know the main thing is how to do things with words. You know, I now pronounce you man and wife is a speech act. It, it, if you are legally authorized to say it, then it means something. It makes something happen in the world. Uh, I sentence you to be hanged at dawn. That, the, the sentence is carried out. So uh, speech act theory is like that. It, it, th statements that have force force of law or the force of authority. But what was the role of speech in, in Occupy? Well, one was the internal speech, the deliberation, the discourse and debate, which was lively, not unanimous, not uh, necessarily consensus. But the other was saying, 
saying something by doing something. Uh, reverse performative. What does it mean to uh, make a demand, to make a statement, to address someone silently by, re by saying, I will not say what you want me to say. This was one of the things that characterized particularly uh, Occupy Wall Street to the frustration of every pundit. They kept going in like this guy saying, well, what is it you want? Uh, or, uh, you know, who's, uh, who's speaking for you? Uh, who represents? And uh, Occupy studiously ref refused, and I think Marina's right about this too, refused the idea of delegating representatives who would stand up and say, I am the face of Occupy. I represent all these people. I will speak for them. Uh, didn't do that. They said, nobody speaks for us. We speak for ourselves. That was a utopian strategy, uh, but it also was a way of, uh, of making something happen in the world by action, by demonstration, uh, rather than by the usual list of demands. I, and in, a, in a way, it was also an acknowledgment. Everybody knows what the demand of Occupy Wall Street was. The fundamental d demand was uh, to change the system, reform the economic system, uh, to produce greater equality uh, across the world. And then a, a, a very long list of additional uh, demands, uh, requests, uh, admonitions. Uh, so it was, it, one thing that I, uh, Occupy did was to, to do that without saying it, uh, to make a demand without articulating it. This came to a head legally in, right here in Chicago when, you remember, 700 demonstrators were arrested in Grant Park, uh, booked, fingerprinted, handcuffed, spent a night in jail, told that they had to post bail and could not leave the state of Illinois until their case came up. When it did come up downtown, uh, the um, uh, arguments were well, there's no question these people violated the law. They were camping in Grant Park. That's against the law. Uh, and uh, finally, m months later, when the judge came to a decision, he actually accepted the defense argument, which was quite simple. Uh, there are two laws in conflict here. One is the First Amendment to the Constitution, which guarantees the right to assemble uh, and exercise your right to free speech. The other is a park district ordinance of the city of Chicago. It says the park is closed at 11 o'clock. And our, our wise Irish judge downtown said, I'm weighing these two laws in the balance. And somehow, it seems to me the First Amendment to the Constitution outweighs uh, this uh, Park District Ordinance. And that's because these people were not camping in Grant Park because they needed a place to sleep. They were camping in Grant Park as a way of saying something. Camping as a statement, as, uh, as an act, as a speech act. Of course, what it says is, you know, up for grabs. But uh, I think the trope of Ocupatio uh, helps us see a lot about why this movement has gone global, uh, why it's so powerful, why it can mean so many different things in different places. And why when people talk about this epoch later, it will be the epoch defined by this word and the image that goes with it. So let's take questions and uh, discuss. So we were going to go back and forth, but I think we should just kind of open it up for our yeah, conversation. Yeah, we're, we're as in a an hour yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. already, so why don't we Since we'll have, go yeah. right to the Q&A. Right. And we might um, take two or three questions together. That way we can get as many voices in the room. Second person of it. We're just going to take the third one and then respond and then do three again. I think. Okay, 
That's a lot already. Should we do? Yeah, let's uh, let's let's take okay. these up. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, just on the horizontalism and contentious politics, I mean, horizontalism, it actually comes from, and it's a bad um, translation of horizontalidad in Spanish, um, which doesn't have a really good English translation because horizontality isn't enough, I don't think, though it's kind of an anti ism. And horizontalidad was used in Argentina after the crisis as people were organizing in assemblies throughout the country, recuperating workplaces, taking over land, the unemployed, massive movements of hundreds of thousands of people. Um, and they used it to just describe this, what, what we've been talking about, this kind of face-to-face -face relationship, um, which doesn't imply necessarily even any particular form of decision-making, which is something that I think got conflated a little bit in the United States with consensus process and horizontalism, and it's, it doesn't necessarily mean that. It just means that you're, you speak and you're heard and you create new relationships with one another in this process, and there's changing subjectivity. There's a lot of things implied in it. Actually, the first book I did is an oral history on the movements in Argentina, and it's called, in Spanish first, horizontalidad, and then in English it was horizontalism. Um, but the contentious politics framework, I mean, which you know, we use in social sciences, I'm a social movement theorist, and so I kind of hit this wall, both in Latin America and then with the newer movements, because, as it sounds, contentious, you, know, you have to have that relationship to the state or institutions of power. That is necessary as one of the components. Um, and it's not that there's no relationship to institutions of power, but it's, it's not the point of reference. That the movements don't start with, okay, we demand, you know, the way we think of social movements or traditional movements, voting rights, the defense of women's bodies, U.S. out of X country. Um, there's not that explicit demand. It's a much more overarching kind of refusal and then claim. And the claim is, I think, has implicitly revolutionary implications, not necessarily of the take over the state or build a party kind of revolutionary, but in an overarching transformative sense. Um, I think we need to, and it's actually a book I'm working on right now, which is, this is not a setup here, but I am working on a book that's um, about societies in movement um, rather than um, social movements to think about what's been going on the last 20 years. Um, ah, there are all of these. I, I'll be faster um, with the others. Um, I'm not sure which ones you want to, should we go back and forth in responding? Just quickly on the participatory budgeting. Um, I don't think it's meant, it's participatory budgeting is something that started in Brazil and Porto Alegre um, years ago. Um, and it's something where the community itself decides what to do with a very small part of the budget. And I don't think it's distracting. I don't think it's going to transform society. But I think the same way in our, the spaces in Occupy, we were kind of exercising a democracy muscle that we hadn't used before. I think participatory budgeting is more just an exercise in, well, what would it look like if we had, if we as a community had to decide what we're going to do with a million dollars? Do we want to fix the streets? Do we want to make a playground? So I think it's good in that sense, but not to look at it as kind of the, an end piece. And I loved your comments about Turkey. I mean, I think as the first part, not so much as a question, I would agree with you completely. I think of recuperate with the language of occupy, kind of taking and turning into something else. And because it's popular, I think it's different than kind of the imposed power occupying and the diversity of people leading to those challenges. I don't know if you were going to talk about that. Should I not do that? Yeah. Okay. So I'll... Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, uh, horizontalism was, was clearly a kind of uh, maybe uh, unstated principle in Zuccotti Park and in American versions of Occupy. Uh, it meant, the, the, to, to me, the best description of this is what Hannah Arendt calls the, the space of appearance in her great book, The Human Condition. Uh, that is, when people come together as equals uh, to discuss and perhaps to act. Uh, it, and she says this is the, the basis by which a public and the political uh, gets formed, but it's not real. It's not politics in the sense of taking power yet, except perhaps uh, achieving a kind of power with a critical mass, uh, enabling its own self-consciousness, uh, its own sense of purpose, and maybe perhaps uh, going on to act uh, uh, and to, to take care of itself. Uh, so it was, uh, as Marina says, an exercise in primitive democracy. But I don't think of it, you know, again, I would contrast it with, uh, with the Tea Party. The Tea Party was, was Leninist politics. The, the, the Tea Party uh, and, and the right wing in the U.S. recognizes the 
that kind of fatal truth, that politics is an extension of war. It's us against them, and the point is to win uh, and to take as few prisoners as possible while doing it. Uh, so Karl Rove is a Leninist, as far as I'm concerned. They basically uh, have the same notion of what politics is about, about taking power and uh, seizing the state, seizing the means of production, taking over the factories, everything. Um, Occupy wasn't about that. Uh, it was more utopian, I think. And it, it, this also relates to the question about Turkey and the internal differentiation. Uh, the fact that Occupy was not like uh, an elite vanguard movement, and it was criticized by that. I mean, Zizek showed up and, and lectured the occupiers in Zuccotti Park. He says, you need to designate a revolutionary vanguard. Get serious. You're having too much fun. This is not... A, a picnic or a festival, uh, get serious. Uh, take ruthless actions. Uh, and the spirit of Lenin was being reborn again there in, in Zuccotti Park, but it didn't go anywhere because that's not what it was about, and that's not what uh, Taksim Square in, in Istanbul was either. And that's why I mean, there is, a, I think, a lot of frustration with, with Occupy's failure to take the next step to politics proper contentious politics uh, to start getting representatives to engage in representative democracy in a very old-fashioned way. Okay, we're going to take another one, two, three. Um, I'm going to, you're going to do the media, right? Okay. <laughs> but I'm glad you're upset because I think that's so, yes, we should, you should be upset. Um, but I won't go to the content of it. Um, as far as the, the newness and the local and the global and what's changed in Occupy, I mean, there are a lot of questions in what you said, and that's great. Um, you know, from my experience traveling to a lot of different places and spending time in a lot of different places around the world, each place saw itself as the only place, the beginning place. I mean, the number of places in the world who got the chronology a little bit wrong, like we started it, and they were off by a number of months because it was actually in another country. And then in Portugal, did you know that Portugal actually started all of these movements and there was this butterfly effect? I mean, people have been saying this all over in each location, and I think it's also one of the challenges that the movements are facing um, globally is not connecting very much. There was an evoking, but I think that has more to do with images and actual relationships and, and thinking about the experiences. So I would see that as a, um, as a challenge. And in the US in particular, the short book, The Occupying Language, and then borrowing from Walter Benjamin, The Secret Rendezvous with History in the Present, it was an intervention. It's actually about experiences and practices in Latin America over the last 20 years and how horizontal coming from that space, the concepts of territory, popular power, all of these different things, um, and using concrete examples um, to kind of remind us that actually we didn't invent these forms in the United States. So that was an intentional kind of intervention in something that was going on in the US. Um, but I think that globally we need more of that reminder and we're hoping to do that a little bit um, with the book. As far as the effect, I mean, it, this is what's really tricky in a movement or these societies in movement that don't look like traditional protest movements with this is our goal, did we win it, did we lose it? What do things look like? And we're not trying to take over the state. So, so we're not in the state, did we lose, even if that wasn't our goal? I think it's really complicated. Um, and so the effect with an E, I think, is also tied with the effect with an A and the feeling part of it. And, and I think one of the fundamental things that's changed in the United States is, and people have said this a billion times, you know, that the conversation changed. But it's not just that the conversation changed around the 99%. I think it's how people feel has changed, how people feel about themselves. So that there's a more powerful anti-eviction movement in Chicago and throughout the United States. I mean, that's people who are facing foreclosure or eviction who go to their neighbors and say, I might be evicted. 
that I don't think would happen before the Occupy movement. I mean, think about the United States and the feelings of shame. If you're going to lose your house, you don't go and knock on your neighbor's door and say, I might get evicted. You say, I'm moving with my relatives because it's, you know, fun. I don't know. I mean, there's this concept, there's a sense of shame around poverty. And I think that the we are the 99% changed that and injected, you know, a different version of class politics, um, but a kind of pride and like, wait a minute, it's not my fault. And I think that's tremendously powerful, and we're seeing that, I think, in the fast food organizing that's happening in the United States, in all kinds of organizing that wouldn't necessarily look like, oh, this is Occupy, but I think that's the whole DNA idea, that there's, there's something in there, and that, that feeling being different in the strike debt movement around student debt, talking about not feeling shame. I now say I have student debt, and I'll say how much, where in the past, somehow it felt, you know, I went to law school, of course I have student debt, I'm not independently wealthy, but there's that feeling of there's, you know, somehow it's your fault, so that, that I think is a big break. So the, the question about media reporting, uh, you know, I think uh, the mass media attempted in many different ways to minimize or reframe Occupy as um, some kind of reenactment of uh, 1968 hippie gatherings. Uh, and they weren't totally wrong about that. People like me who were there in 68 showed up uh, and I think, you know, cast our blessing saying, yes, finally, uh, you're, you're in the streets again. Uh, you're taking over the park. That's, that's really great. Um, it, it, so there was a kind of attempt to char characterize it as just, just a student movement, nothing but uh, or nothing but the unemployed, of which there were a great many. Remember, this is uh, post-2008 when unemployment went skyrocketing up to 10% in this country and much in the black community, 25%. Uh, so, uh, but the media uh, always underestimate these things. It's, it's part of their job. And, of course, with Fox News, the reason why that Fox News, that fake Fox News man was so prominent in the iconography of Zuccotti Park was because this was like the enemy network uh, inside uh, Occupy Wall Street. Uh, it produced a kind of uncanny uh, uh, riffing on the media presence itself and it attracted the media. What are you doing here? Well, I'm here to manifest media bias. Uh, is, that's part of the, of the performance. Um, the question about 68, 1848, 1789, uh, I, th I think first the jury is still out. It's not, uh, it, you know, we don't know what the long range results are. I agree with Marina, a change in conversation did take place. Uh, Obama finally was slightly awakened to the fact that maybe economic inequality was. Uh, uh, should have been higher on his agenda all along. And he also began to see that the Republican Party is a, is a Leninist party. They're not interested in negotiating. They're not, inter not interested in compromise. Why it took a smart man like him so long to figure it out uh, is beyond me. Uh, but I think Occupy helped him remember where he came from, uh, why he was there. Uh, I think you're right. The right wing has been in ascendancy for... 25, 30 years in this country. And uh, it, it, even as it loses every specific policy battle, every specific struggle, gay rights, uh, women's rights, um, but r right now it, it knows how to control the instruments of power. Right now, ballot boxes all across the country are being closed down to poor people, people without papers, uh, black people. Uh, no Sunday voting in Florida. So they are incredibly clever at real electoral politics. The left is real clever at theater. Um, I hate to say it, but you know, in some ways Occupy was great theater followed by a lot of micro uh, movements and a change of conversation. And I think also a change of feeling as well. I, I, I really love your point about people not being ashamed now to say, you know, I'm losing my house. Um, and uh, you know, ask for help. Uh, that wouldn't have been true uh, in a lot of American cities uh, not so long ago. But there was also a question about masking. I think you asked a question about masking. Well, I, I'm not sure I got the force of it. Can you say? Oh, I was just asking if you saw like um, any kind of connection between the 
connection between these images that we're talking about being both mapped and also feminine. Um, uh -huh. And I don't know, I guess what that mm -hmm. means for occupies a movement that wants to reach in the public space, mm -hmm. which is historically not a place for female. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Just, I was really interested in the images you showed. Yeah. It's a great question. I'm not sure I have a good answer to it. Uh, you know, it was no doubt that, it, I mean, the nonviolent aspect of, uh, of Occupy, uh, and including in Terrier Square, uh, manifested by violence against women becoming uh, a kind of iconic moment. Um, and that's been true in different places around the world and in Latin America over the last 20 years, and particularly now in the climate organizing, the, the police targeting of women and parts of women's bodies. And it's actually interesting that the language, though, of a feminization of the movements because of the forms of organizing is something that's being talked about a little bit more in Latin America than in these movements. But I think that's something to think about with whether it's going back to the feminist movement or just thinking in general about how we think about yeah. male and female and relationships. Yeah. But um, I think we're about at wrap up. And so we're going to have to discuss all of them informally for the yeah. sake of Let's have of a drink and, and talk about um, all then, these questions. But this is great. Part two.